Hello, you're listening to On Israel, Al Monitor's podcast, I am Ben Kaspi from Tel Aviv. The protest against uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been going on non-stop for more than six months now. Every Saturday, tens of thousands of Israelis gather outside his uh, official re- uh, Jerusalem residence, his private uh, Caesarea home, at major intersections and on bridges around the country, waving flags and banners. Netanyahu and his people had hoped the protest would die out. They were wrong. But the protest is also not taking off to the extent that its organizers had hoped. It is too fragmented, made up of different groups with different causes, and it lacks a cohesive leadership. Nonetheless, its energies propelled thousands into the streets week after week, even in the rain and cold, all demanding one thing, Netanyahu, go home. Surprisingly, and against all odds, Knesset member Eli Avidar has become the political face of the protest. Avidar represents Israel Beitenu, the hawkish party of Avigdor Lieberman. He is a strange bird in Israeli politics, and he certainly does not fit the profile of a popular protest leader. The Egyptian-born Avidar was a successful businessman, director of Israel's Diamond Institute and Diamond Exchange, a foreign ministry diplomat who served as advisor to Foreign Minister Ariel Sharon and headed Israel's mission in Qatar. He has since maintained extensive ties in the Gulf. But his behavior in recent months has been anything but diplomatic. Avidar has become a modern-day Israeli variation of the 1960s French student leader Danny the Red, although he is hardly a socialist, on the contrary. Although he was only voted into the Knesset in 2019, his energies have left behind veteran opposition leaders such as Moshe Bogi Alon, Meretz party leader Nitzan Horowitz, and Yeshatiz Yair Lapid. He has become most identified with the protest, not them. He is the most outspoken, the most persistent, and the most photogenic and his prediction that Netanyahu would be toppled once 300,000 protesters take to the streets has become one of the slogans of the protest. For now, the number of protesters is more like 30,000, but Avidar is not giving up. We will talk with him about the likelihood of new elections, about the new party formed by Gidon Saar, about Avigdor Lieberman, and of course about the protests against Netanyahu and the chances it will change Israeli reality. Knesset member Eli Avidar will join us right after this brief commercial break. If you are listening to this podcast, you obviously care about the Middle East, and if you do, you should probably be reading El Monitor. El Monitor is a global newsroom headquartered in Washington, D.C., with a network of over 160 contributors around the world. El Monitor offers first-class reporting and analysis from a range of perspectives and an approach that represents the highest journalistic standards, as well as an award-winning commitment to press freedom and independence. If you haven't done so already, visit us at elmonitor.com, check out our articles, and sign up for our free newsletters. There's a lot to choose from, including the Week in Review, an essay that offers unusual insights and forecasts into the region based upon El Monitor's outstanding reporting. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to our El Monitor podcast on your favorite podcast platform, On Israel with Ben Caspit, and On the Middle East with me, Andrew Parasoliti. Now uh, we have the pleasure to say hello to uh, Knesset member Eli Avidar, Israel Betenu. Shalom Eli, how are you? Hi Ben, excellent. All right, let's uh, let's start. We're in the middle of a political chaos in Israel. Actually, we are talking on Sunday. We will be up in on the air on Monday and uh, late on uh, on Tuesday, we will all know if you're going to the fourth election in a row or not. But first, let's talk about the protest against the prime minister. And I want to ask you, why do you think that you have become a symbol of the protest? Do you remember the first time you joined the demonstrators? What was the trigger? Was it planned move or uh, did just it happen? Um, 
I will start by saying that I didn't grant myself any title or uh, or any uh, uh, any status in this protest, but uh, I will say that uh, I'm trying to be consistent and as much as I can, um, very committed 24-7 on this protest. And uh, it's basically started right after the, the third election that was carried lately and the formation of the coalition. Uh, I'm a member of the Knesset and I'm sitting in the committees and I see that the coalition uh, of uh, Likud, the ultra-Orthodox parties and uh, Kahol Avan are very consistent by uh, voting 100% with uh, the commandments of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. And I saw that there is no uh, effect. Uh, I couldn't even, uh, you know, uh, uh, have a discussion, a, a real discussion that we usually have in committees in the Knesset. And I understood that uh, we are living in a situation where the coalition is really, really obedient. And this is why I understood that the salvation will not come from the parliament and there is a need to do something public. And this is why I went on the process. And uh, uh, if you're asking for a specific date, the 5th of May, 2020 was the first, the first speech I gave uh, in the General Assembly of the Knesset. It was called uh, In the Name of Democracy. I spoke for something like 16 minutes explaining uh, based on the book of Professor uh, Robert Paxton. Uh, the anatomy of uh, the anatomy of uh, fascism, how he explained how uh, countries in uh, in the 20th century in Europe became uh, dictatorships, not because the people voted for it, but because there was uh, a campaign against uh, high public officials and uh, basically making them quite weak and. Uh, the ruler, the leader of uh, the ruling party was able to transfer uh, the status of the country from a democracy to a dictatorship. And I was trying to say to the Israeli public, you're really living in uh, some kind of a dream that this will never happen to us, but it's actually happening. Maybe I'll ask you now a follow-up question. I, I did not plan to ask you, but you talking about fascism. Do you really think, you know, in the bottom of your heart or when you're alone, that we in Israel, the Jewish state, can be a fascist, fascist state? Can Netanyahu become a, a real dictator like Erdogan in, in Turkey or, or, you know, Putin in, in Russia or, a, or worse? I wouldn't go for the term fascist because uh, fascist is a specific academic term. And uh, I wouldn't say that... Uh, the situation here will comply with this. Uh, I will say that uh, what Netanyahu did from the beginning of the Corona crisis, that uh, he used the Corona uh, by taking a lot of authorities that never had in the hand of any prime minister in the state of Israel since the establishment of 1948. So there are certain issues that if you see, let's for example, see that uh, the Shin Bet the Internal Security Agency is actually monitoring uh, the, the, the cellular phones of all the citizens. This never happened uh, since the beginning of the corona in any democracy around the world. Now you ask me if uh, this is a coincidence? No, it was an actual plan uh, program dictated by Netanyahu. And the number one element that I would say that I was extremely concerned about, you know, Ben, what was the first move we took in February 2020 at the beginning of the crisis of COVID-19? He basically put all the discussions in the cabinet, in the government about COVID-19 uh, yeah. under... Uh, uh, under shadow and uh, the public cannot know and read whatever is said in those, uh, in those uh, discussions. And mind you that this is a prime minister that he's willing to reveal the most uh, secretive secrets of the Mossad of doing operations in Iran. But the discussions on COVID-19 is now a secret uh, in front of the Israeli public. Not only a secret, you know, it's, it's uh, not only other shadow, it's, it will be, uh, uh, the government decided 
the, the protocols of all these uh, discussions and uh, committees about COVID-19 will be under censorship, under heavy censorship for 30 years. So you have to ask yourself, what do they have to, to, uh, to hide from us? But let's go on, uh, uh, Knesset member Avidar. I, I'm cu curious, where did you come with, from with the digits, with the numbers of, if we will have 300,000 protesters, then Netanyahu will be toppled and go home. Yes. Uh, you're asking me why this number? Yes. I know there is, uh, a, there is a reason behind it. There is a reason, and, and there is logic behind this number. I, uh, With your permission, I will not reveal it, but I will just say that uh, I'm monitoring uh, Benjamin Netanyahu for the last 30 years. I, I believe that I know him quite well. And you know that I'm in a party that my chairman, Avigdor Lieberman, uh, is probably one of the most familiar uh, political figure with Benjamin Netanyahu. So... Uh, I, I, I'm willing to say that uh, I know some of the issues that uh, have an impact on Netanyahu. For example, the demonstrations in uh, in front of his uh, official residence. This is something that uh, takes him off control. Uh, and the 300,000 uh, protesters, I believe that that will be uh, some kind of a move, some kind of a change that will topple the government. Uh, it will have an effect not only on Netanyahu, but on the circles that Netanyahu counts on, on the public officials that Netanyahu is able um, to basically bring them to total obedience to his uh, sometimes crazy ideas. So that's why I believe that a massive demonstration of 300,000 people in front of the official residence will do the, the change. You know, your, your, your leader, Victor Lieberman, is not a guy that you uh, automatically will connect with, with this protest. And uh, you became one of the most uh, outspoken leaders of the protest. So one can ask himself, is it a stunt, a political stunt or maneuver to mobilize support among the protesters like Yair Lapid did in the 2011 protest? Or is it unique and, and, and authentic? Uh, first of all, you know, you're arresting a politician, so I'll, I'll definitely tell you that it's authentic, but uh, let me substantiate this, <laughs> this statement by saying this. First of all, I didn't do it uh, for voting. Uh, if, you, if you will go into my uh, Facebook page or my Twitter account and uh, you will see what people are writing me, uh, for example, leave your party and uh, then we will vote for you. I, I usually reply, don't vote for me, go on protest join the Balfour uh, demonstration on Saturday evening, because this is what's important. So I, I must confess that, yes, probably, uh, Avigdor Lieberman is not the type of, uh, of a politician that will go on demonstrations. Definitely, it's not his uh, cup of tea in terms of uh, action, but he definitely supports it. He definitely supports uh, that the public will start thinking about the orders coming from the government, the, 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 the public needs to analyze what is uh, said to him uh, by members of the government and by Netanyahu himself. So to return to your question, I didn't do it for uh, people to vote for me. It was not, it wasn't motivated politically. The motivation was basically that there is a crisis. There is something that I cannot solve uh, in within uh, the Israeli parliament because of the coalition, the obedient coalition. That's why we need to go on protest. And uh, this is why I did it. In the end, you know, if you check the polls, you see that I'm not getting major votes from, uh, from uh, uh, the public that is uh, active in those uh, demonstrations. And I, I totally accept it. This uh, was okay. not the motivation. Last question about the, the, the protest. Do you think that Netanyahu and his people are using the police to crack down the protesters? What marks would you give the police for its handling uh, and containment of the protest? Are you worried about uh, potential violence by some pro Netanyahu activists? And have you felt personally threatened? First of all, let's start with the police. I give them uh, the mark zero. I give them the mark zero because uh, 
Netanyahu is using the obedience of the police to uh, the authority, the higher authority. And this is why then, if I may say so, we need a constitution. We need a constitution that stands beyond uh, the parliament and beyond politicians. Uh, if you take, for example, what happened a few weeks ago in the United States, I envy the American system where the chief of staff, after there were rumors that uh, Donald Trump is trying to uh, activate a major military campaign uh, right before he's leaving the White House, and uh, it was uh, well uh, written in the papers that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the chief of staff and other uh, people in the government were opposing it. So the chief of staff went to uh, the national, uh, I don't know, the military museum, and he gave a speech which was amazing. You know, we do not comply our uh, allegiance to uh, king or queen, and we do not uh, pledge our uh, support to uh, a dictator we do uh, protect the constitution. And we in Israel do not have a constitution. And that's why the police, when they receive orders, they have to calculate and take a position. Unfortunately, until now, the police is totally obedient, but they forget. And uh, it is our role to remind them that we live in a democracy. And in a democracy, the, the role of the police is not to stop demonstrations, but definitely to allow them, to make them happen. And uh, this is something I cannot see right now. I hope with the new uh, uh, chief of police, this will change, uh, but I'm not extremely optimistic. Um, you asked oh, me about- uh, did, you, did you feel threatened? Uh, I personally don't feel threatened, but uh, a few weeks ago there was uh, uh, an uh, ultra radical uh, right wing guy that uh, went on Facebook and sent me a message. You need a bullet in your head. And uh, I, I really didn't pay attention to it. My aides basically went to the police. The guy was arrested and uh, the police is uh, pressing charges against him. So I don't know exactly what happened with him, but I'm really afraid for the safety of, uh, of the protesters. And I'll say why. If you go into the demonstrations, you will see that 90% of the people are at the age of 70, 60, sometimes 80. And sometimes they are uh, confronted by uh, uh, very radical pro Netanyahu demonstrators. And uh, they are very uh, loud, they are very uh, uh, violent in, in some of the cases. And uh, the police is not making an effort to, uh, to stop those uh, radicals. The police is actually uh, trying to stop the demonstrations. This is the irony and the sad situation that we are living. Do you think we can, we can reach a civil war in Israel? Is it a, a real danger or, you know, after all, we don't see many Netanyahu supporters in the streets. We don't. Uh, we see that, I always say that if you check exactly how many people come to demonstrate, it's between eight to 12 people. Uh, this is the number of people that Netanyahu has that go around. Um, I don't, you know, I wish that we will not have any civil war or uh, uh, something that will be major, uh, but, but we have a situation, we have to be frank about it and realistic. We have a situation of a prime minister that will do everything uh, and anything basically to, uh, uh, to keep his uh, seat. And, and I told you before that I envy uh, the American system. And you can see that even Donald Trump that doesn't want to leave the White House, you can see that the Senator Mitch McConnell basically uh, gave a speech a few days ago and said, this is it. And he's a Republican. Uh, yet you, no, you see... don't see similar phenomena in Israel or within the Likud. Everyone is uh, neither either a pro Netanyahu or anti Netanyahu, and, and you are worried. They are anti Netanyahu when they are uh, when they talk to you in secret rooms, in closed rooms. They are extremely pro Netanyahu when they are uh, uh, interviewed by the media or they have to give uh, public statements. Uh, they all uh, speak uh, exactly what he tells them to speak. And uh, this is worrying. 
Uh, but I always ask myself, uh, when will be the trigger of the Israeli public uh, to go on a major demonstration? And I'm speaking about 300,000, and I do not understand, honestly speaking, why we do not have one million demonstrators in the street when this guy, the prime minister of the state of Israel, is destroying the economy, is managing uh, the COVID-19 crisis within his political interest. I do not understand what is happening, and, and, I'm, and I'm criticizing myself as a politician that I'm not doing uh, a better job, and I have to do a better job in this situation. Let's uh, turn to politics. Uh, it will be not fair to ask you, uh, to, you know, to predict or what's your assessment about the huge, uh, really huge political drama we are uh, stuck in right now. Uh, there, was, uh, there were the, uh, negotiations all over the weekend between uh, Netanyahu and Gantz in efforts to, to reach a, a compromise that will allow this government to exist and uh, will, uh, will secure Gantz's uh, turn as prime minister one year from now. So when this podcast will be aired, it, it, it will be actually the moments of, uh, of the decision. So I will not ask you this. I will ask you about the new star in the political arena, Gidon Saar, who is already taking away voters from everybody, from your party, from Bennett's Yamina party, from Blue and White, of course, from Yeshatid, and from Likud. Do you feel betrayed by some of the voters? You know, without uh, Avigdor Lieberman, in, in, the, in the first round of election in 2019, uh, Netanyahu would form a government and get himself immunity from, uh, from the trial, and everyone was uh, sitting in his home right now. Absolutely. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, Gidon Saar is not a newcomer to our political system. He's, uh, he's now the blue-colored eye boy in town, uh, but this is why we see him uh, soaring in the polls. But uh, let's give him some time. I believe that uh, this is the nature of the Israeli public when they react to uh, new names, new parties in uh, new polls. Uh, I, I do not uh, believe that he will stay in this high, uh, uh, high predictions for his party. Uh, he will need to maintain his uh, glory for a very long time to bring uh, new names and to uh, do stuff. But... Uh, the fact that I told you that he's not a newcomer, it means that uh, we know him quite well and he has uh, uh, a very uh, clear agenda that was uh, exercised in the last, uh, uh, in, in many years, uh, as Minister of Interior and other positions. He's, uh, he's very clear about his position of uh, state and religion. So I believe that uh, some of the people that right now are uh, responding in polls that they will vote for him, when they will be reminded of his position, I be, positions in, on the various issues, I believe that this will, uh, will uh, go down a little bit. But uh, regarding uh, the reaction of the Israeli public, I, I, I personally do not feel betrayed. I, I take it as a note for us to do a better job. And... Uh, the fact is that in the last uh, three rounds of elections, we had between five to seven uh, mandates from uh, Kaholavan that uh, responded in polls that they are considering voting for my party. And uh, one week before the election, uh, the media advisors of Benny Gantz took out some kind of uh, a very simple video or a statement or uh, an ad in the papers. For example, in the last round, they say, we are going to form a secular unity government. And seven mandates moved from Israel Beiteno to Kaholavan. So I definitely can, can blame the Israeli public for, his, uh, for being naive, but uh, I... I I prefer to say that we did not do a good job enough and uh, we have to do better. Do you believe Gidon Saar when he's saying uh, out loud that he will not sit with Benjamin Netanyahu in any circumstances after so many people believe Benny Gantz saying the same 
and then joining Netanyahu. I, I guess only Yair Lapid and Avigdor Lieberman really kept their word on this issue. Absolutely. I, I don't believe it. I, I, I don't believe it. Not that I'm saying that he is lying. Uh, I'm just saying that when he will reach a point where he will see that there is an opportunity, I believe that he will take it. Uh, there are very, very, very few politicians, and one of them whom I'm close to is Avigdor Lieberman, that uh, Netanyahu tried to seduce and uh, to convince to go in. And if you remember the first round of election in April 2000 and, uh, 2019, we were uh, five members of Knesset, and he offered us everything, everything, everything ministerial positions, uh, deputy prime minister, uh, uh, even a position within the Likud for future to replace Netanyahu as leader of the Likud. And we said, no, we do not want to speak about uh, ministerial positions. We would like to speak about the agenda. And Netanyahu never speaks about the agenda because the agenda is always flexible. The agenda, he cannot speak about the agenda because it always changes. Uh, in accordance with his political interests. So that's why if we go back to Gidon Sal, uh, I believe that we need to see who will be in his uh, list of candidates. I believe to, uh, we have to see who, the, who those people are. And if you just ask me about Gidon himself, if there will be no other choice of if he will see an opportunity, he will definitely sit with Netanyahu. Is there a chance that uh, your party, which is uh, distinctly anti-clerical, you know, uh, Avigdor Lieberman is uh, actually in, a, in war with his uh, former friend, Ari Deri, and all, all the other Orthodox. So after all this, can you sit uh, or join a government with the ultra-Orthodox parties in order, you know, to topple Netanyahu and, and get a majority? Uh, then uh, I'll be... Very honest with you. Um, we explained that uh, the aggressive attitude adopted by the ultra Orthodox parties, uh, Shas and Agudat Israel, uh, excluded them, as far as we are concerned, from being in the next coalition. We sat with them in the past uh, in the past years, but they took an advantage of the shaky situation of Netanyahu, shaky. Um, legal and political situation of Netanyahu and went on a campaign to destroy the status quo on religion and state subjects. And as you know, uh, my party is very keen on maintaining a status quo and uh, we do comply or we do believe in, uh, in, uh, in the sentence of live and let live. We are not trying to uh, uh, to impose our secular way of life in religious cities, but we definitely do not want to let uh, the ultra-Orthodox parties to uh, impose their way of life mm -hmm. on cities like Tel Aviv. There is a difference between Bnei Brak and Ramat Gan, between Bnei Brak and Tel Aviv, and this difference is, doesn't need to be destroyed. It needs to be celebrated because this is the strength of the, state of, of the state of Israel, that we celebrate our differences, our different cultures, our different beliefs. Um, but they take it as, uh, they take basically the, the shaky situation of Netanyahu and he's, uh, and him being so weak and dependent on them. And uh, they went on this campaign. That's why we do not see how we can sit with them. A last political question, because we're out of time, and I want uh, also to, to, uh, to get a chance to ask you one question in the end about coronavirus. But the last political question, you can, you can answer me briefly. Do you think uh, Victor Lieberman's dream to become uh, the, Israel, uh, the prime minister in Israel is still possible? It is possible, but uh, Lieberman declared more than once that for him, becoming prime minister is a desire, but definitely not an obsession. Uh, the status says uh, a leading candidate for prime minister will be reasonable if we will get in the polls or in, in the elections, of course, around the 20 mandates. If you don't have 20 mandates, uh, this is something we cannot uh, take into action. There is one exception in Israeli politics. This is the mayor of Jerusalem. Uh, he is the mayor of Jerusalem with not even uh, one member of council. 
but this is one exception that I don't believe that we can uh, uh, impose or, uh, or, or have it here in Israel. Uh, a word uh, about the coronavirus. You are perhaps not a COVID denier, but you have uh, claimed several times that Netanyahu is making political use of the pandemic. And you have uh, even declared just now that you would not get vaccinated for now. Is this a responsible position for an elected official? Uh, in my opinion, yes, and, and I'll tell you why. I am a, a graduate of SARS while I served in Hong Kong as Consul General. I saw exactly, uh, and, and I saw how a much, graver, uh, much greater crisis was handled by a political uh, government. And I want to be clear, Netanyahu has been uh, using COVID-19 since the beginning for his political interest. He took advantage of uh, the anxiety of the Israeli public Uh, from COVID-19 and made uh, even uh, efforts to intensify this anxiety among the public. Uh, he took powers to himself, powers that were never in the hand of any prime minister. Uh, I basically said that uh, I was asked if I would get vaccinated and replied that I'm not in a risk group and therefore I will not be, uh, I will not uh, get vaccinated. Uh, if, if you If you want to know what is a responsible position of politician, we are living in a democracy and therefore nothing should be forced on citizens. And I do believe that people should think and shouldn't uh, automatically comply and being obedient just because uh, the prime minister has said so. Definitely, if we don't trust him, definitely, if we see that he's trying to maneuver the political system to uh, escape his uh, legal problems and courts, That's why I, I do believe that uh, people should think. And if there is something, when they ask me, I didn't say don't go get vaccinated. Although, uh, you know, the, the spokespersons of uh, the prime minister are saying so. I didn't say that. I, I say that if there are people in the risk group and they want to get vaccinated, they should. And even they are not in the risk group, if there is a young guy of the age of 24, 25, And he's terrified because of COVID-19 and it doesn't allow him to live normal life and he wants to get vaccinated. He should. There is no problem with that. But even if there is someone in a risk group at the age of 80 and he does not want to, take, to get vaccinated, it is his freedom. We are living in a democracy where people should think and should, should, should have the freedom of choice. If we would live in North Korea like Netanyahu wants to bring them, to bring us to this kind of system, Uh, the prime minister says, get vaccinated. We all need to get vaccinated. Do this, do that. This is not the way democracy is working. And definitely not the Israeli democracy as I want to maintain it as a politician. Knesset member Elia Vidar, it was fascinating. I thank you very much for this conversation. We'll be just back after a short commercial break with some final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Andrew Parasoliti, president of the award-winning media news site, El Monitor, where we cover the Middle East with some of the best reporters and columnists anywhere. And I'm excited to announce our new podcast, On the Middle East, where each week I will interview newsmakers from the U.S. and the region about the latest news and trends with additional commentary from our on-the-ground correspondents. Those of you who follow the region know that what happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. And to cite another great movie line, every time the U.S. tries to get out, the region pulls us back. Your time is valuable, so let me promise you this. You will learn something and you will never be bored because each week we'll be talking with and listening to those leaders who are making the news and shaping the trends in this critical and fascinating region. So please subscribe to On the Middle East with me, Andrew Parasoliti. Thank you for staying with us. In the eye of the storm of the unprecedented political crisis in Israel, Knesset member Elia Vidar from Israel Beitenu and one of the most outspoken demonstrators against Prime Minister Netanyahu says he joined the protest movement last May after he realized that crisis cannot be solved only in political tools. Avidar is optimistic 
regarding the chances to topple Netanyahu either in mounting protest or fourth election. He believes that Avigdor Lieberman's chances to become Israeli Prime Minister one day are not doomed yet. He fears Israel is on the verge of becoming a semi-democracy instead of a stable and flourishing one and blames Israeli police of becoming one of the most efficient tools of the regime to crush the public protest. I think uh, it's enough for today. Hope uh, you enjoyed it. Hope to see you next Monday. This is Ben Kaspid from Tel Aviv. Thank you very much. Take care.